Now we have another video which actually shows you taking this out on the ocean and showing what the open ROV sees from under the water. Uh, is that video ready? If so, let's go ahead and roll that tape. Okay, so this doesn't have a soundtrack, so maybe you could just explain what's sure. going on. Sure, yeah, so this is a video from uh, a month or two months ago where Eric and I traveled to Key Largo, about four miles off the key coast of Key Largo. We were with NASA as part of their NEMO mission, and they were going to Aquarius, which is an underwater research laboratory um, that's about 70 feet um, underwater, and scientists are able to go there and, and dive and actually do saturation diving, so they're able to go for you know, up to 10 days at a time and study for long periods of time. And so this is the ROV's point of view. The camera is in the ROV. Right. That, that footage right there is actually from the, the GoPro that we've attached um, to the top because the GoPro had just much better, much better footage. So the way this works is that uh, you're connected to a computer somewhere on land and whatever the ROV can see, you're instantly seeing it on your computer? Exactly. There's the, uh, a live feed right back to the to the screen and you can just log into the, the IP address that's on the ROV so you, eventually we'd like to be able to control these from the internet so you could just pull up a browser and log on and maybe go to visit the Aquarius underwater lab with with an ROV. Does wireless work underwater or does it have to be connected by wires? It does it, it doesn't work uh, underwater so our, our ROV does have a tether. Okay. So it's limited sense. as to how far it can go. It, it absolutely is limited um, at this point. Um, we have a number of people in our community who are very interested in, in uh, developing more um, autonomous features, so working without um, a tether, and we're really excited and, and encouraging those folks. But with the tether, you're also sending data, right, so you can drive it and steer it and tell it where to go? Absolutely, yeah, exactly. So controlling the motors. There's also a servo on board the um, inside the... Uh, inside the compartment that'll turn the camera up or down and then eventually control the robotic arms and things like that. So while this is uh, running, are you up in the boat somewhere watching this on your computer? Yeah, exactly. So we're, we're uh, on the surface and you can see the tether there uh, dragging behind the and What about the, the buoyancy? How does it go up or down? Yeah, so the, the ROV is neutrally, it's, it's very, very close to neutrally buoyant. I'd say it's slightly positively buoyant. Right there you can see the, the uh, motor um, and the thruster on the top so that allows mm -hmm. you to go up and down by th either thrusting up or thrusting down. How long did it take you to design this? You know, this, is, this project has been something that, that Eric and I have been working on for, for over a year. Um, uh, it's come a long way. I mean, you can go on our website and see some of the early designs, but um, it's gone through a number of iterations. It's something we always like to talk about. It's kind of failing our way to success. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I guess this type of research is not totally costless. It must cost a bit of money. How do sure. you finance it? Yeah, so that, that's another interesting aspect. So we've put our project up on Kickstarter. We put it up about a month ago and we've already raised at $95,000 at this point from lot, our community. A lot of people might not know what Kickstarter is, so right. maybe you could explain that sure. a bit. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So Kickstarter is a, is a crowdfunding platform that allows you to put your creative project, whether it's a film, a music, uh, a CD, or if it's an underwater robot. And uh, if, if you have some fans and people are interested, they're able to pledge support for um, the project. And in our case, we had the actual kit uh, as, a, as a reward level, so people could pledge and get uh, one of the first open ROV kits. So people could pledge different amounts of money, and depending on how much they pledge, they get more rewards? Absolutely, absolutely. So we have uh, a series of different reward levels, of, you know, being, going from just being listed on our website all the way up to um, you know, sponsoring an open ROV expedition. Now, my understanding is that when you put a project on Kickstarter, you declare how much money you want to raise and the deadline by which you have to raise it. And if you don't raise the money by the deadline, you get nothing. Exactly. So you set a funding goal, so the amount that you need to make your project go, and then you set a duration, so you know, between 15 days and 45 mm -hmm. days. We set our, our goal at $20,000, and we did it for 30 days. Uh, fortunately, we were able to reach our goal within just a couple hours, so it was really, really an exciting, exciting so day for us. And after the deadline passes, uh, are people still pledging more money? Are yeah, they... people are still pledging uh, up and they're still pledging right now. So we've, you know, gotten a number of pledges actually today. Now, does that say something about the, the strength and size of your network, the fact that there are so many people who know what you're doing? I mean, are there a few big donors or are there lots of small donors? 
Oh, it's mostly small donors, right? So it, we've had, we have over 400 backers, which is really, really amazing. I think, that, I think what it says is that people are really excited about having a, a low-cost open source tool like OpenROV. And, and really, this is the first time that we've had the technology to do this. We've, this is the first time that we've been able to do something like this because we have access to TechShop and we have platforms like Kickstarter. Now, there are people with tons of money like NASA. And I noticed that NASA was somewhat involved in this also. So it sounds like you're working with other groups as well. Yeah. Uh, being open source, we're open to working with, with just about anybody. Um, and um, NASA has been very, very helpful and encouraging. They have an open government team on NASA who's actually exploring ways to bring open source uh, technologies into uh, NASA's work. Uh, and they've been an incredible, uh, incredible contact for us, and they've been very supportive. You usually think of NASA as space exploration, but some people say that there's more useful knowledge to be learned by exploring the oceans than by exploring outer space. It'll pay off sooner. Well, absolutely, and, and the exciting thing about underwater exploration is you could drop one of these ROVs in and um, be exploring actual life. So if you're, there's... 95 percent of the of the space where life can exist on this planet is underwater, um, and so we're really we're excited to be opening opening that up. Do you have plans for bigger and better uh, ROVs? Uh, I don't know why it would need to be bigger if it's basically taking pictures. Right. Well, um, we we have plans to to continue to grow the community. So. It depends. It all depends on what the community is able to co-create. So it's um, it's a little bit bigger than us at this point, um, and we're excited to see. I mean, we we hope that we can we can transition into uh, bigger and and more exciting robots. But so it sounds like the community itself is kind of a platform, is, and it's not just the open ROV community, but the maker community as a whole, which might have a lot of cross fertilization between your project and other projects. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just to give you an example. Um, Tech, just being at Tech Shop for us has been a huge, a huge advantage. You can see this, this bend of the acrylic is actually mm -hmm. a, a pretty important design feature that wasn't always obvious to us. But a, another maker at Tech Shop who's working on a different mm -hmm. project said, hey, why don't you guys think about doing this? So it, it is definitely this kind of cross-pollination of ideas that happens at Maker Faire and that happens at places mm -hmm. like Tech Shop that are making all these projects uh, go. Because very often you have proprietary systems where you don't want anyone to know what you're doing, but in that case you don't have the benefit of other people so I think this is a, a pretty good approach, bringing a lot of people in, having it critiqued from every possible angle. You know, people always give us a hard time. They said, you know, are you, are you patenting this or how are you going to do this? And, and we just keep saying no. We're just going to continue to share the designs. And I tell you what, we're having a lot of fun. Yeah. And we're going to have to stop right there because we are out of time. I'd no like problem. to thank you for Thanks being here. David Lang from the Maker Fair, Open ROV. Uh, this is Marty Wasserman. Uh, Thanks, Marty. Join us again next time for future talk. We'll see you next time.